Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the ateliers. Today we have our last artist talk in the Indian Summer Series. Uh, our guest is Andy Holden. Andy, welcome to the ateliers. Thank you for having me. Uh, I've been speaking about your work with some of the participants here in the studios. Uh, I was happy to meet with you in Venice last summer. So you had a, a presentation for the Pinchuk Art Prize. Um, an amazing installation. I was very happy that you accepted our invitation to come and see us, meet the artists in the studios, and talk about your work, which is uh, a large complexity of different materials, techniques, formats, media. Uh, I'm very happy you want to do this talk. Um, for those of you not familiar with Andy's work at the moment, there's a, uh, kind of a special show on view in London, uh, organized by Mark Angel. Mark Angel is a, a very uh, beautiful organization in London that enables artists to create visionary projects which are otherwise hard to realize. So uh, it's a very special organization. And Andy made a very special work for that, but I'm sure you're going to tell us a little bit more about that in your talk. The talk will last about an hour. Please switch off your cell phones and listen to Andy. need to get you to say your name out loud to the camera, give a pause, and then start reading from the auto cue. I'll tell you when to start. Can I just ask, is it MIMS or MIMS? MIMS. MIMS. <laughs> Thank you. Good question. <laughs> uh, actually, can I just... Yeah, it's brilliant. When you're ready. MIMS. A manifesto of maximum irony, maximum sincerity. We live in an age of irony in mourning for sincerity. Art reflects society and if society is to drown in the belly of the ironic whale that swims in the sea of postmodernism, so shall art. We live in an age of irony because of the sins of sincerity. The beautiful and sincere flowers are all too easily plucked and rearranged in the unflattering vase of mediocrity. The flower withers away, leaving the vase empty. Maximum irony, maximum sincerity, is an artistic movement for the sorrowful, yet joyous, the disillusioned, yet innocent, the ironic, yet sincere. Let us not be ironic about our sincerity. Let us be sincere about our irony. We all know that art is not the truth. Art is the lie that makes us realise the truth. A work of art made according to Mims can be more moving than one which is simply sincere, or simply ironic because it acknowledges the gap the essential unfulfilled yearning in all of us. And yet it's also ultimately hopeful. Mims is all about the willingness to be lied to and the will to believe. It's all about the intense sadness of our unrealistic dreams and the intense joy of our desire for them. It's, it's about the attempt to communicate truthfully in a world in which this is seldom ever possible. We hear a song that moves us to our very soul. It's so poignant that it becomes ridiculous. It's ridiculous how much we're moved by art. Let us then ridicule ourselves at the same time as we celebrate in our souls. Therefore, Mims celebrates the ridiculous. Mims is not emotionally cynical. We should not be cynical about emotions in our work. We are simply cynical about the means we have to express that emotion. Can a song, or a book, or a film, or a play ever really contain and communicate all those surging emotional waters? Are they not always simplified, always scaled down from the personal, raging forest fire that they were when they first began? And yet, is this not the very beauty of our whole endeavour? Happy ending. Music swells, boy kisses girl, camera cranes up to reveal beautiful surroundings. All is well with the world. It is ridiculous. Yes, but it moves us. Yes, but it is ridiculous. Yes, but it moves us. It is ironic. Yes, but it is sincere. Mims acknowledges that our ultimate aim, that of completely truthful human connection, is almost never reached. However, for acknowledging the infinite potential we have for failure, Mims creates a final product that succeeds in spite of, and because of, our ridiculous dreams. Let us face the world with a smile on our face and a tear in our eye. Maximum irony. Maximum sincerity.
Thank you very much. <laughs> So when I was uh, 2003, I was 20, um, I wrote this manifesto with some friends called Maximum Irony, Maximum Sincerity. This was before I'd been to art school. Um, it was a response to, I don't know, just finally, I decided I wanted to be an artist when I was quite young. I guess I was like 16 and I set up a little studio in the back of my house, my mum's where my mum's washing machines and stuff were. And, um, and me and a group of friends from the small town where I live in Bedford uh, decided to start an art movement. And um, we all made a bunch of stuff. Um, and our, our general feeling was that the world, I don't know, we had this very high expectation or aspiration for what art was going to, could be or would do. That it would be this emotionally rich kind of space of kind of truth or something. And then we started to go out and try and see some art and uh, were quite disappointed. I mean, everything seemed quite cynical, everything seemed quite cold, seemed quite detached, seemed quite ironic in some ways. Um, I don't know whether that was what I was putting upon it. It seemed very hard to make something sincere because lots of the things that seemed sincere had been um, co-opted by kitsch or commercial interests, you know, things like the big sentiments. The big sentiments were like hard to talk about. So we formulated this idea that we, we'd, we'd talk about it, we, we, this idea that art had to be both ironic and sincere at the same time. It had to be, and completely both. Um, and so we put on some plays and some exhibitions, and we lived, yeah, in Bedford is a small town with no art, really. And it, of course, it just didn't do anything. No one, you know, there was, no, there was no potential for it to work or to do anything. Anyway, I went to art school, and I tried to talk about it. And the tutors weren't interested at all and didn't really know what I was talking about or maybe I couldn't express it. So I abandoned it and left it. Um, and 10 years later, um, I noticed some of these phrases bubbling up online, uh, post-irony, the new sincerity. A lot of these kind of languages, people trying to reformulate ideas of how to kind of communicate directly with this new tool of the internet. And that we hadn't had as a vehicle for disseminating our work. And so I decided what it would do was to try and bring MIMS back. What it would do is like drop back in time and try and work out why this thing that hadn't worked, you know, whether it could work, uh, whether this kind of almost time traveling experiment. So what I did was rebuild the entirety of MIMS as an art movement, as a single work. I am. Um, took over to this church called the Zablovich Collection. They gave me kind of 18 months to make this piece, which was very generous. Um, and the work was to basically about this manifesto. The work was made according to the manifesto, um, but also about it. So I tried to use these ideas of MIMS to, f to make a new work of MIMS. And to do that, uh, it's, uh, what I did was meet up with all the original signees of this manifesto and talk about what we tried to do and why, what we had been wanting our work to be at the time. And then turn these into scripts. And then I put an advert in the local newspaper with my manifesto on the front page. So 90,000 people woke up one morning in Bedford with a 10 year out of date manifesto through their door. Um, for real, which was kind of this amazing moment of the work finally becoming, becoming real again. Um, and then there was an advert saying, if you wanted to be in a film about Mims, come and audition. There's a big film studio in Bedford. This is where it's actually Chris Nolan's studio where he made Inception and a number of films. Um, and there's, there's this weird box on the outskirts of town, which was the kind of only impenetrable cultural fortress of Bedford. And these teenagers, so what you just saw was the screen test. They all had to read me my manifesto back at me as passionately as they could. And the best of them, so this is like a film about it, so there's me talking about it in front of it. But uh, it's quite hard work to show, so it's seven screens and it's 90 minutes, and the actors play me and my friends in reconstructions of our attempt to start this art movement. Um, and they talk about, they use what our scripts uh, are flipped into the present tense, so rather than being in past tense, they talk about um, what MIMS was to them, but in, in the present. Um, it uses lots and lots of old work that I made at the time, that I, luckily my mum had kept in, the, in, our, in my house, and my friend's mum's had kept quite a lot of their work, so a lot of it was made out of that, and then lots of it was filling in the gaps with making pieces I'd like to have made at the time, but didn't have maybe the means to do so. So these are old, these are all my old works from when I was about 18. And then old performances that I made from when I was about 18 or 19 were reconstructed by the actors. 
individually, I think the works, most of them, not, maybe not that good. Um, that was a little piece of just spending all day in Bedford, having my photo taken, shaking hands with as many people from Bedford as I could. There's a mini golf course that we made. Um, but on mass, the idea was to show the totality of the uh, endeavor, to try and show what uh, all the interpersonal links between the people who are part of this failed art movement. All the music is made through children's choir and orchestra uh, doing covers of songs we wrote at the time, which were only love songs. The idea was for Mims that the love song was like the ultimate work of art. Uh, and therefore, lots of what we did was these performances where we performed these uh, kind of elongated, slightly strange love songs. So the soundtrack is made by this children's choir covering these songs. Um, what I also noticed was that, um, although I'd written this manifesto when we were between about the ages of about 18 and 20, um, they were ideas that haunted a lot of the rest of my work. This idea of uh, this blend, I suppose, of uh, irony on the one hand and sincerity on the other. Although I thought this was something I'd done and left behind was, of course, uh, the, the dialectic between these two was the, the mode that I'd been operating in all along. So in a way, this was a way of kind of re both revisiting my old work, but also reframing it in terms of my new, like a very current piece. So it was both a piece about how I was then and how I was feeling at the time. This is a work called Last Stop for the Good Old Times, which I started when I was 17 and then finished, what was that, 13 years later, which was to buy every idealized image of childhood from a Bedford charity shops as they came up. Because the whole, the whole work, I suppose, is about nostalgia in some ways, but not, it's not a nostalgic piece, it's quite scathing. Um, the kid who plays me gets a very hard time, and both by me, across the camera, I talk to him a lot. And this, is, this is me in my reconstruction of my teenage studio on the left, and my friend James. Um, and we, it's, I don't know, we don't come out of it very well. We look quite pretentious. Um, and we were. And, but the work is about how we, kind of, um, how we can only conceive of the past in the light of the present. How do we kind of, is there any way of even acts? So it uses all these different modes of, of the, uh, so there's documentation, there's reconstruction, there's theatrical uh, depiction, um, there's archive footage, there's sculptural sets. So this is a cafe where we signed the manifesto. This is the kids replaying our signing of the manifesto in the cafe. And the idea that to be able to access this collective part, this, the space of collective memory, you needed all these different modes uh, kind of assimilated. And the idea is that you, you're kind of amongst it and you don't know, you feel like you're experiencing all the pieces separately, but then you get above the show and you can look down on it and you see it all as one large kind of total piece. together last night. I haven't actually seen this video for maybe five years. Um, it's a video called Return of the Pyramid Piece. Um, when I was 12, um, my, dad is, my dad is an ornithologist, um, kind of an amateur ornithologist who managed to turn it into a profession. So he studies, he looks at birds and he enthuses about birds and writes about birds. And um, when I was about 12, we took uh, some time out of school and travelled around the Middle East uh, where he was doing some talks on birds. And while we were there, we went to visit some of the major tourist sites. Um, we went to the Great Pyramids of Giza. And being slightly left to my own devices, I was just prowling around the bottom of the pyramids. One more, and then I, I climbed up a few rocks and I stole a piece of rock and put it in my pocket and took it home. And in its own right, this act is something of very little consequence, I suppose. But when I got home, my dad said to me, he said, you know, if everyone did that, there would be no pyramid left. You know, if everyone did that, would that be okay? And to me, this was like the, my induction into what's the Kantian idea of the categorical imperative. That's like your bottom ethical line, right? I mean, if you do it, maybe individually it's okay, but if, every, if it was rep repeated by everyone, would it, you know, is it sustainable? And the answer in this case was no. And so I became... I felt terrible about stealing this bit of rock. I felt really awful. And as a kid, I put it on my bedroom shelf and it like inflated in my mind into this strange guilt object. I was like, I wanted to have not done it, but I couldn't not do it. And I certainly couldn't put it back. It was just there 
looking at me and going, why didn't you just buy a souvenir like everybody else? Like, I mean, you could just buy a souvenir. You didn't have to take this. Why did you take this piece of rock? And I couldn't really answer that. And then, then I, I was whatever, I was about five, six years into um, early work as an artist. And I was making works around monuments and pieces of monuments and scale and uh, the relationship between the part and the whole. And then I remembered this piece of rock. And I was like, this piece of rock was actually this kind of very formative moment for me. It was this first encounter with sculpture. This was like the first sculpture I can remember seeing was this pyramid. And it was overwhelming. And I had to have it. I had to have some of this. And I wanted some, the authentic thing. You know, so in a way, lots of my later work, I suddenly realized, was, well, it was, maybe it was like in some way working through some of these, you know, everything that in this moment of taking this rock from the pyramid was actually what was in so much of my later work. Um, and I was trying to think for me at this time, like, what was art? Like, what was like, I don't know, what was it for? This is something that most of my work's about. What's it like? What's it, what can it do for me and for other people? And I thought maybe art is like an emotional experiment. That's what it is. I mean, for some people, it's a formal experiment. Some people, it's a spatial experiment, a theoretical experiment, I don't know, an experiment in politics. For me, it's mostly an, ex it's an emotional experiment. Um, and I thought what I'd do was go back to Cairo and try and find where I'd taken the rock from and put it back. Um, which, to see if this could be undone, like not in, or what to undo something might even be. So I went, so I, at this time, I was, I was still living at home and uh, I got some money together, traveled to Cairo and uh, this is filmed by like an, an Egyptian tour guide who's gone a bit wild with the VHS camera. Uh, I mean, he'd never used a camera before. What you can't see just off screen is I'm also giving away all the rest of my money to the police to try and give, buy me extra time on the pyramid because of course you're not allowed to climb on the pyramid anymore. So in undoing this, I was actually doing far more damage than of course I'd probably done the first time. Um, but I don't know. It, this is the video. Um, the music is called Last Stop for the Good Old Times, which weirdly is the same title as that piece of uh, all the idealized images of childhood you saw in the last work. I use that title a lot. It seemed to resonate. Um, it's a piece of a string quartet and marble game written by my band, The Grubby Mitts, and it's, uh, you can just hear a faint sound of a marble dropping through, and that conducts the strings. So this tiny inanimate object kind of conducts this kind of big esoteric string section. Quite bad acting. I'm not sure. I think I'm just prolonging. At this point, I'm just prolonging it. I don't like trying to eke out the experience a tiny bit more. And then when I got back. I had this video, but it wasn't enough, you know. And before I went, from, I, I needed, I didn't want it just to be about my experience. I needed to make an object that kind of communicated this, ex, I don't know, my feeling towards this piece of rock in a slightly different, like articulated in a slightly different way. So before I'd gone, I'd made all these drawings of the rock and models of it um, in a kind of slightly obsessive way. And then I got back and I decided to make this piece called the pyramid piece. So this in a way is like a monument to that piece of monument. It's a scaled replica of the piece of rock scaled up 100,000 times in volume. It was a very tiny fragment, it was only about this big. Um, but it's all knitted, it's all made of it's textile. It took about, about a year to make. Um, I'd never made, done any knitting before. Um, so I went in the deep end and um, the idea was to sort of show the rock as it had seemed to me as a kid, not as it was, but as it kind of seemed to be. So there's this large, and like, and the idea was it would somehow be soft. I mean, it was, although it was an aggressive, the piece was, I don't know, it's, guilt is a difficult thing to kind of depict. Um, but the, the textile gives it this sort of feel of like, maybe also like it becomes itself a landscape. But the idea was this tiny piece of monument for me had been, mo it wasn't the monument that had been monumental, it was the piece of the monument that had been monumental. So it was, in a way it was a kind of monument to this piece of a monument. And the two things were shown in relation, you had the film as you came in, this was a Tate Britain in 2010. And um, uh, although weirdly actually it was made in, it was made in Holland, it was actually made in uh, Weifhausen, uh, in a, uh, in that fortress, um, I don't know. Yeah, that's an, that's a digression. How I ended up in Weifhausen for so long, I'll never know. But um, this was this was in a way was a product of that. So it was kind of it was, it was kind of lovely. Um, so, but 
I guess this work has a lot of the things that then became... My work varies widely in technique and subject matter and whatever. But at the heart of it, often you have this one thing, which is a very personal anecdote, and then a kind of overinvestment in it, a kind of mining of it to try and open it up towards something that maybe speak, that hopefully becomes not so personal. It becomes about something far more, I don't know, dare I say universal, but it's like something that you strive for, right? A work that can kind of... Uh, and funny enough, this became far more in the newspapers, more about returning of cultural artefacts and the legacy of the British kind of colonial... It was kind of interesting. It, take, it took on this life of, a, of other meaning, um, which wasn't a coincidence, but certainly, you know, I had to use this very personal lens to be able to talk of something maybe less personal. And at the time, Egypt wanted a lot of its objects back, and so this kind of moment of me going back and putting this thing back and then making a work about to manifest this became, became far more about that than I could have ever anticipated. And then there was a third small piece in the corner, which was all the on the sec on the trip back. I bought after I returned the rock. I bought not just one souvenir of the pyramids, but every version of the pyramid that I could buy, made out of a different stone. To a friend's to house, a friend, to a friend's, to a friend's a house, friend's to a friend's house, to a friend's house. The way. The way, the is, way is never is long. Never is to a friend's house. To, to, never. to a friend's house. To a friend's house. The way is house. never long. Way is to a friend's house. To a friend's house. The way is never to a friend's house. Never long. Is never long. To a friend's house. House. The, the way, way is never, is never, never long to a friend's house. The way is never long to a friend's house. The way is never long to a friend's house. In 2011, I had this 
show uh, at Kettle's Yard in Cambridge, um, which was a difficult show for me for, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it was where I, l I learned about modern art, I suppose, for the first time. Kettle's Yard is a, it's an old gallery attached to the university, uh, but it's where I saw sort of shows by when I was growing up, Ben Nicholson and Henry Moore, and it was kind of, so it was, but not the place that I ever expected to be able to show. Um, the shows leading up to it have been like John Cage and Agnes Martin, and and it was more, it was more the, that was more the sort of thing they showed. And, and I, I got this call that I could do the whole, you know, have the show there, and it was to bring together about four years of performances and posters and sculptures, and and um, this was quite daunting. And so what I thought I'd do was invite my best friend to curate it, rather than use the curator in house, which was quite contentious. Um, because he wasn't a curator, he was someone that I'd uh, known for a long time, but not, not, um, but we were incredibly close, and so, but he knew me very well as a person, and he knew what all the works kind of meant, and he was going to be this kind of interpreter for the show. So every week we would meet in my studio and record this tape where we would talk to each other across this tape, which was going to be the background, back of the book. It was based on Flaubert's Bovard and Petiche. Um And um, we've, Worked out how we're going to do the last room. Uh, we were uh, um, we sort of put that together. This is some images of the last room of the show. Um, and uh, then he would left my studio one afternoon after recording the tape um, and vanished. It was killed in an accident. And um, so I was left with this huge absence uh, and half a show and um, half a book. But also I was left with this incredible fragment for some reason before, and it sounds, every time I say it, I sound like I'm making it up, but I wasn't. Before he left, he wrote down this phrase, uh, he said, uh, which said, thingly time. Um, and on the drive to the, st before, the studio before he left, he, he, he came up with this other phrase, which was chewy cosmos, which was off the back of his star bar that he'd been eating. And he's like, we should call it something to do with, the so I was like, okay, we'll call this show chewy cosmos thingly time. But I didn't know what thingly time was. It was a thingly, Dan, he said that thingly time, he thought this was, it was something he'd got, a bit of it from Heidegger, and he got a tiny bit of it from Marx, this, and he got the rest of it from sitting in my studio looking at this sculpture. He was like, it's, so it's something about how objects eke out a duration, how they have a kind of hidden temporality and all their kind of spatialness. But I, I didn't really know what thingly time was. Um, so what I did was I had to think fast, and I didn't want to cancel the show, so I did, I made a library. Uh, I switched everything for the second half of the show as a library made out of all Dan's books that uh, his, uh, he left behind, which was an incredible collection of philosophy and theory and sci-fi. Um, he was a self-taught kind of autodidact, which is why Flaubert's Bovard and Pesce was such a key book for us. Um, the, li the carpets in the library are all made out of quotes from Bovard and Pesce. Um, I built all the furniture and I kind of arranged the space and it contains lots of fragments from all my old, from works that we'd had in the studio. Um, it's, in Kettle's Yard, it was experienced as kind of as, a, as just as, as a sculpture of a library, I suppose. Um, but then a year later, I was uh, given the chance to reshow it in London, in Cubit, where it became more of an active reading library. The idea was that Dan had left behind this idea of thingly time, so I called it the Dan Cox Library for the unfinished concept of thingly time. And the idea was that this would be a space to try and work out it's done a it uses the tradition of memorial libraries, but it's not a memorial to Dan so much, I mean, it is, but it's to this idea, this idea of thingly time, this unfinished embryotic concept that didn't get the chance to live in the way that it should have done. Because it seemed like potentially brilliant. And I think this was just before, I mean, the object-oriented ontology had just been bubbling up through the kind of London art world pipelines and everyone was reading things like Harmon and Latour and t um, Timothy Morton, but we hadn't seen that stuff yet. So it was kind of right on the zeitgeist of this moment of thinking about, kind of rethinking through objecthood. So the library, when we restaged it in 2012, became a really great kind of place for people to, the idea is I'd invite artists in and they could use the library to make performances and readings and um, activate it, using Dan's books as a space to kind of forward, to contribute their own idea of what thingly time might be. Um, it gradually, and it keeps on traveling and keeps on going on, and each time I add more of my sculptures that maybe for me seem to have something to do with thingly time. Um, it also has a curated section, which is like a kind of traveling library display containing artists' work who wanted to contribute. So you, that's last week's speaker, Michael, who in the corner there with one of his concrete pieces. Um, 
someone I was talking to her about herons earlier. There's, that's the heron that I was talking about. Um, there's Ed Adkins' draw a very early work of his, on like that back of her head, and then Kurt Vonnegut um, and uh, Stephen Claydon. And this is a very beautiful piece by Daniel Etok, actually. These are all, all masking tapes and adhesive tapes bought from uh, a mile radius around the gallery, all stuck to the ceiling. And then gradually, as the show goes on, the tapes sort of gradually drop down and close off the show as like a kind of curtain that kind of descends over it. So this idea that objects have this kind of duration that sort of lingers within them. The show normally has these collages by me around the walls as well, which are pretty simplistic things. They're just images culled from astronomy books with little wobbly eyes stuck on. This was it re-shown in Wising Art Centre for the five-year anniversary. Um, it also has a little book now that goes with it which gathers all the readings and the texts that have been generated by it that kind of sits as an archive at the heart of it. It's a performance by Heather Phillipson doing a reading in the library. And then this is Steve Roggenbach doing a reading in there. Steve, this is the first performance Steve ever did in the UK. I don't know if you know his work. I would, for me, he's, he was the reason, I, part of the reason I went back for Mims. Uh, his, I saw his videos online. He's a kind of internet poet, was how he described himself. He made these videos uh, where he would yell into a camera in the woods. And I always thought there were more Mims than Mims could ever have been. They were the sort of ultimate in irony and sincerity as one new kind of form. So I invited Steve over from America to do this reading. Um, and then actually a year later, Steve and I made a show in London. Uh, this is a slight digression, but I wanted to share it. Uh, together called, uh, if you Instagram my dead body, use Walden but tag it no filter. Um, which was a combination. Steve isn't, does not see himself as an artist, but he, you know, he, he, uses, uh, he's just, he lives off his YouTube channel. He just makes these videos. But it was interesting. We made paintings together and sculptures together and uh, showed some of his classic videos alongside my telegraph poles, with, which I stenciled lines of his poetry on. Um, I show it because also it was the first time I showed this work at the heart of it, which is uh, a collection of uh, ceramic cats. Um, this was, um, so here's, these are paintings me and Steve made together, our po poles we made together. 666 is hard to explain, that's Steve's idea, whatever. Uh, then there's like, uh, it was kind of, there's a big gap and he likes to yell 666 when no one's speaking, um, which is quite difficult to, but anyway. Then there's a video in the middle called uh, Catharsis. Um, so I, um, my grandma, oh, you know what? I just... My Grandma passed away recently. She was 90 and had been in a nursing home for the last couple of years of her life. We'd been close, enhanced in part by her living nearby, just at the end of the street. So she was normally around most days after school, and she'd been genuinely supportive of me wanting to be an artist. When she died, she left me these boxes as my inheritance eight cardboard boxes containing her entire collection of China cats. So I thought what I'd do was unbox this collection. So let's unwrap the first one. Grandma collected these over many years. They filled her small living room floor to ceiling, displayed on wooden laminate shelves and every available surface. The thing that particularly struck me as a child whilst gazing at this collection of china cats was the fact that she never actually had a pet cat. Around the age of 10, I broached the subject with my mum. If Grandma likes cats so much, why doesn't she just get a cat? But I realised now that I'd entirely missed the point. Yeah, because she couldn't stop him going out of the house. She would fill his wallet with Monopoly money, which the man at the betting shop would accept and play along with the transaction. And then we would collect the money back at the end of the day. And it would leave a kind of trail so we'd know where he'd been. So this, it, it's, it's 20 minutes of me just unboxing these cats and talking about my grandma, but and cats as kind of symbols and various things until it becomes apparent. I'm basically trying to work out why she collected these cats. And then it becomes very much about actually my granddad's Alzheimer's and her kind of trying to regain control. And then uh, I developed it live, actually. I did it as a stand-up 
comedy show for about a year uh, before it became a sculpture and a video of a uh, that went with it. But the joke at the end is uh, that my, um, after it becomes quite weepy, I mean, it's quite sad. And then uh, the voice floats in and says, Andy, I think you've got to stop there. You've got to stop there. How does it feel? And I say, it felt cathartic. So, which is this, anyway, that's, that's, that's the entire show and the whole sculpture. So it's called Catharsis. Um, my current show in London is uh, a collaboration with my dad, um, which we've been working on for about six years. It started off through um, a number of performances that we would do together. I, in some ways, I had a lot of luck. In some ways, no, I had a lot of luck, but I didn't make any money. I, um, I got the show at the Tate when I was 26, 27, and it was, which was kind of insane for me at the time. But uh, I never had a really commercial gallery, so none of my work sold. So I was making these quite large-scale installations, but um, I had to live at home <laughs> with my mum and dad for about seven years while I was getting started. Um, and living at home with my dad was a challenge. Um, he is obsessed with birds. He, so all he does is kind of talk about birds and work with birds. So I figured to, like, to live at home again, we needed, some, we needed a kind of common ground. Because he'd, he'd been responsible in the 90s, he had a TV show about, uh, on this TV show, Blue Peter in Britain, and then this one, Bird in the Nest, which is about getting young people involved with looking at birds. But of course, the one thing you do if you're the son of someone involved in telling you to do something is you don't do it. Um, so I became obsessed with art, but maybe our obsessions were similar, but the things we were obsessed with were different. But as an adult, we had to kind of, I don't know, I had to, so, we, so we developed this piece by accident. I mean, he'd never, he had no interest in art. I started collecting birds' nests, and I started looking at them, I thought maybe for something to do with sculpture. Um, I started looking at how kind of well-made they were and intricate and kind of bizarre, and uh, asked him about them, and... He was like wanted something that he had not that been that interested in. For him, the bird's nest was always just an innate of something birds can just do. Uh, something that actually ornithologists pay very little attention to, it seems. Um, so we developed a performance called Electron Nesting, where we would just hold up different bird's nests. And my dad would like try and explain them through science, and I would try and kind of tease out something more, try and find like maybe what they were about. Um, so this went on, for, and we developed through this about for about well, five years of kind of doing this performance once a year or so until it became a kind of script for a potential film. And so the current show brings together this body of work around the bird's nest. Um, and it's billed as collaborative. So our angel also commissioned some pretty kind of large-scale artworks by British artists. But, um, but I wanted it to be co-authored with my dad. So the show is Andy Holden and Peter Holden. Um, it's just sort of his first, his first exhibition. Um, because he loses all his body of work and he uses all his material. So it starts with these two photos that he took of me age one, with a bird magazine that he edited, which he used trying to use as an advert for this magazine, once with it the right way up and once with it upside down. Um, I'm going to show you a clip from the main installation. Bedfordshire. It's an invisible village that exists within our own, and it's likely to have been here as long as the oldest houses. In autumn, nests such as these suddenly become visible, uncovered by November winds. These masses of twigs wedged in the forks of high trees sway wildly. It's a very primal image. The trees always appear like slow explosions, and the nests like scribbles over the lines of a colouring book. These are made from large interlocking sticks, wrestled into place by the rooks, and then lined with the soft grass. And these are also a type of cup-shaped nest, far larger and scruffier than the hummingbird, but related in form. Rooks nest colonially, with large numbers densely packed into a copse or wood. Yet despite this, each rook does have a small territory round its nest. And it will have to defend this territory too, as much stealing of nest material goes on, many rooks pillaging from unoccupied abodes. This is an example of a domed nest. This is elegantly oval, and perhaps the most perfect object found in the British countryside. It's the nest of the long-tailed tit. These are normally concealed in thick, prickly bushes, making them very hard to find. These nests are even more remarkable when you think that a long-tailed tit can make a nest like this in its first year, having never been shown how to do so. And it does seem hard to believe when you look at how this is made. 
The material used is a compact mixture of moss and gossamer, lined with feathers and the outside embedded with hundreds of flakes of lichen. It's an almost magical object. Something I find odd is that birds' nests, as objects, don't have names. However, reading around older documents, we found that the nest of the long-tailed tit had been an exception. In the past, it had numerous old country names. In Norfolk, it had been known as the bush oven. In Northamptonshire, it was the oven's nest. In Suffolk, it was the Putney poke. In Nottingham, it was a bum barrel. In Buckingham, it was a bottle tom. And elsewhere, it's been referred to as a feather poke, pudding bag, hedge jug, jack-in-a-bottle, long pod, and poke bag. So it takes you through all the different types of birds' nests hundreds of birds' nests. It's really, really detailed. I mean, we researched it. it to, to make this work, I had to basically become an ornithologist. And me and my dad travelled to most of the museums in Britain which had collections of nests. We built up our own collection of nests. Um, and as far as I'm aware, there's no, there's no... I mean, in the 1920s and 30s, birds' nests were kind of a subject called calliog calliology? Calliology. And then... Um, in a way, it kind of dropped away because uh, they didn't want to encourage people disturbing breeding birds. So there was very little research into birds' nests. So to do this, we had to almost become built. the kind of experts again in... in uh, um, and we went to Amer the Natural History Museum in America and, and we got to see all these kind of rare specimens. Um, the video is half an hour, it takes you through all these. Uh, but it finishes up with this. The diverse and seductive creations assembled by bowerbirds. However, perhaps these should not be included as they're technically not nests. These are made by the male bird for display. Once the bird has found a partner, the female will build a nest elsewhere, which will be used to rear the young. But they are an absolutely singular phenomenon in the natural world, having evolved out of nest building to be the only known structures built by any organism, except for humans, that are not used as a home or shelter. Their whimsical subjective assemblages centered around an elaborate sculptural form. These are so unlikely that when first discovered by Western researchers, they were thought to have been made by undiscovered forest tribes. There are a number of different bowerbirds and each one makes a different structure. The Vogelkot bowerbird builds a moss-encircled maypole, but then covers the area. I don't know if you know about bowerbirds. So yeah, they make, they're, the, they're not, they look like nests, but they're not nests. And in Descent of Man by Darwin, he says they're really the only, they're the only kind of thing that we know of that's made that isn't a home or shelter, it's not utilitarian. You can explain it away in terms of sexual selection, but they're, as I try to, the, what you feel through this work is, I'm, my dad is always arguing it's innate, it's instinct, uh, and I always try and argue for some other kind of potential, uh, in the moment of interaction with material, that something else seems to be going on. In the moment of the bowerbird, even Darwin conceives that they have to have some kind of sense of beauty or some kind of aesthetic sensibility. So it's the one moment that links our, in, our instinct as we know it, maybe with the natural world. Um, so the bower is like the central motif of the show. Um, and I built this scaled up replica, it's just kind of built to human proportions. I made sort of tons of maquettes before I worked out to do it, it's all made out of willow. And, it's, and then the f you see, as you come in the show, you see the central screen of the film through it, which is just the nests rotating. And then the left and right screens, I mean, my dad is obscured, but then you go around there and you watch this kind of let's call it an Oedipal drama, where me and my dad like, kind of argue for I don't know, my own free will or something. But the, kind of, the bowerbird motif is the central moment, because it's the one moment where our two kind of instincts come together. Uh, this is my collection of bird's nests that's then displayed in a vitrine. Um, why the bowerbird is pivotal is that downstairs in the show is a new work called uh, A Social History of Egg Collecting. So upstairs is like a natural history museum, but downstairs in the basement things get a bit weirder. It's a it's meant to be the social history. Egg collecting is, and as far as we know, it's a kind of a complete history that's never been told. I, I've been started researching it in 2006. Um, and it's a, it may be, a, you can tell me, a peculiarly British phenomenon. The idea that basically um, in Britain, yeah, egg collecting was rife. But what, what was peculiar about it, I'll show you the very beginning and then I'll explain a bit more actually. Egg collecting began with fervour, or certainly methodical documentation, in the early 19th century. It was part of the almost always aristocratic, amateur scientist drive to classify, name and understand the natural world. Expeditions were undertaken to bring back specimens, primarily the skins of birds, for taxidermy, display, but most importantly, for classification. And with this drive to understand the natural world, the collecting of eggs began in earnest. 
the noble pursuit of the gentleman scientist is exemplified in the journals of John Woolley. Um, so it starts off as an aristocratic pursuit, uh, and it becomes the backbone of many of the big museums. And then it gradually uh, becomes amateur scientists take it on. Lots of people collect eggs at the beginning of the 20th century, and they contribute a lot to the history of ornithology. Then it becomes a common pastime for uh, children and um, Anyone who's interested in the countryside collects birds' eggs. But then in 1954, it becomes criminalized, and it gets driven underground, and this kind of network of egg collectors starts up. And then by the time you get... to the, 20th, the late 20th century, um, it, carries, it's been, it becomes kind of driven down to this sort of, not just underground, but kind of... I mean, it, People went to prison for four or five times for egg collecting. People would amass these collections and hide them in their attics, hide them in their lofts. Um, total obsession. Was, um, and as far as I was aware, this was a narrative that had never really been told. It was this kind of, and it was a history that spanned, in 100 years, you get a complete history of the British class system, from the, aristoc uh, from the aristocratic gentleman scientists through to people going to prison for four or five times for amassing eggs. Um, and in a way, it was a way of kind of talking about our whole change of the relationship with the countryside. The whole thing's narrated by me as a CGI crow. Um, uh, and all the backgrounds are made out of paintings that let you know where you are in t the time. Uh, so you've got, it uh, starts with Constable and you end up with uh, George Shaw. Um, this is the biggest ever singly amassed illegal collection of eggs that in that anyone knows of. It was 7,707 eggs found in a painter and decorator's house in Lincolnshire. Um, so what I did for the other, the last work in the show was I recreated this hoard. It, um, it had been destroyed. So the idea was that once egg collecting was illegal, even when these collections were found, they had to be destroyed so as not to kind of legitimize them. Even though a lot of the scientists at the museums would have loved this collection. This was as good as the British uh, Natural History Museum, but it had to be broken up. Um, because of the way it was put together. But this caused a lot of distress because actually this would have provided some really important data around uh, use of DDT on the countryside. Um, it's a long, it's a, the whole film is half an hour and it explains the kind of ethical dilemma around this. But the last work is I, this is the photo I saw in the newspaper in 2006 of this hoard of eggs. And I worked with a, 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 an old gamekeeper in, uh, to recreate them all in porcelain. So it's all, uh, but exactly, and then display them exactly as he'd had them hidden in his house in these fish crates and boxes. It's a kind of interestingly repulsive image, um, but it's also very beautiful. I mean, I, th I feel like this has like standing over this image is sort of all the dilemma that I am um, around how one can inter how one is that can interact with the countryside. And again, it comes. So the bowerbird is a collector. The bowerbird is celebrated for gathering beautiful things and putting it around it. And here, this collector had done the same, but it's vilified and. Uh, and he went to prison for it. Um, so that's, that's the, the, and it's all set in an old natural history museum in London. These are the Gillymore eggs that he, uh, the detail of one of the other, some of the other rare eggs that were in that collection. And the world. History's come to an end. The world has come to resemble the cartoon landscape. The golden age of cartoons proved a prophetic, short-lived glimpse of the world we now find ourselves within. An examination of the laws of cartoon motion might help us construct a theory of how an artist can proceed within a landscape in which everything is already done. Where every action is seemingly possible, yet certain actions reoccur. For in the cartoon landscape, it seems like anything can happen, yet not anything can. There are rules that emerge as over time we begin to make observations. Law one. Anybody suspended in space will remain in space until made aware of its situation.
close the window, Sylvester. Uh, let me in like a good kitty. <laughs> Law 2. Any body in motion will tend to remain in motion until solid matter intervenes suddenly. Law 3. Any body passing through solid matter will leave a perforation conforming to its perimeter, otherwise referred to as the silhouette of passage. That's just a trailer for the film. Um, I've been working, this last few years has really been occupied with this idea of like, I guess what, like long form works, things which is, uh, you know, works, I mean, so the natural history film that took about six years and this film took five years. Um, from often working through little iterations on the way through testing things out with normally through performances, um, but then to try and find, like make a vehicle that can contain a number of different ideas within one uh, kind of myth methodology. Um, so Laws of Motion in the Cartoon Landscape started from an idea of how to th think about the world now. How to, so the idea, all right, here's, here's the pitch. Uh, the world is now a cartoon, uh, and the way to best to understand it is to then look at the way, I guess, cartoons function, which isn't not, not necessarily their logic, but they're kind of the shape of expectation that happens within it. So my the premise is that um, the kind of speed increase to such a point and things that happen in particle physics and kind of quantum mechanics and politics were all best understood as ca in, in the realm of, the, of, of, a, of cartoons. So cartoon theory might be a way to understand the shape of uh, the world at the moment. Um, so it, it takes these ten laws and breaks them down, and the film uh, takes you through it law by law, but it, it allows a lot of room for digression. The other reason I made this work is, interestingly, it came out of an idea for an artist talk in 2010. That's how long it took to make. Yeah, six years. Um, where a lot of I was a word I was using to like, talk about some of my sculptures was cartoony, but I didn't really know what I meant by that. So the, this, is, this was in Weifhausen. Um, it's a, a work called Folly. They're all called Folly. This one was called Folly. That one was called Folly. I mean, then they were Follies. Um, they were all front. They only had a front. From where you could, from where they were visible from, you could you thought they were round, but you could never access because they'd all have a particularly fixed viewpoint. Which would uh, this one had its back to the sea. The one in Weifhausen had a what do you call them? <laughs> Straight line of water. Um, like uh, is it's, it meant you couldn't get to it to know that it was anything other than round. Um, this is in Athens. Um, they were kind of what, what I was calling kind of mute motif. They were kind of, but they were definitely evoking this idea of this kind of boulder from the Wiley Coyote trap somehow. But they were kind of looking, they were kind of monuments to nothing, but they were also these kind of follies. This is the very last one I made. Uh, maybe this is 2014. It was called Folly. This was the last one I built it above my house in Bedfordshire on the top of the, the only hill in Bedford. I'd also been making these sculptures that are. I guess felt like they might have had some relationship with the background of objects from cartoons. This is my the same grandma who has the ceramic cats that you were introduced to earlier. This is the very last photo of her. Um, she's posing with one of my sculptures for me. This was an outdoor work I made, uh, just a giant version of a megaphone. Um, so the idea with this piece was, I think I'll just show you, I'll show you two clips. Um, 
one that it looks at the history of animation and how moving image kind of how uh, um, as a way it kind of examines the mechanisms of cartoons to try and tell us about the world at the moment. And then it also constructs its own kind of slightly bombastic theory of this uh, that the world uh, is best understood as a cartoon. So let's let's find let's find you two clips. In a cartoon, you can do anything. Here's a quick history of animation. Through the early elastic creations of Walt Disney and Uber Iwerks, and the permeable screen of Max Fleischer. A multiplicity of heterogeneous factors collided to cause the emergence of the cartoon landscape. The new technology of photography changed the way it was possible to perceive the world. The photographic experiments of Edward Mybridge broke down movement into cells, enabling motion to be seen in a new way. And these new images soon began to move. The thomiotrope had become popular in the 19th century, and this soon led to the phanakistoscope, a device that used the persistence of vision principle to create the illusion of motion. This was swiftly followed by the zoetrope, a spinning drum with strips of images viewed through slits, which allowed pictures to magically move for the first time. These soon resulted in the invention of the simple animated cartoon. This is Emil Cole's Phantasmagoria, made in 1908 and named after the 19th century phantasmagoric machine. From so if you imagine, uh, and it takes you through, da, da, da. this is law one, which we introduced you to earlier, and then... ...with the collapse of the banking system in 2008, following the bursting of the US housing bubble. Capitalism as a whole operates with nothing below it. Ungrounded, it hovers, oblivious, until it looked down and became self-conscious. When it realised there was nothing beneath its feet, it came crashing down like Wiley Coyote or Elmer Fudd. The artist in the cartoon landscape must too find herself in this position, walking out over the cliff edge and onto thin air. If the artist becomes self-conscious, aware of the laws, aware of the weight of history, then the idea and the artist plummet downwards. Knowledge of the laws of the physical world and of history bring with them a self-awareness that in turn renders the possible impossible. Consciousness of the laws makes conversion to the laws inevitable. I think that might be a good place to stop. Um... <coughs> that's not stopping, that's starting. Um, yeah, um... So it takes, yeah, so it takes these laws that happen in the cartoons and then tries to apply them to other things. So it applies it to the 2008 banking crash, but also the idea of, as an artist, this relationship that you have with history and how to overcome that. What I think is interesting for that formulation there, that the idea that if you walk out over a cliff, you don't fall down unless you look down. Um, at the end, it takes the idea that Bugs Bunny is the ultimate artist because he can walk out over a cl cliff and know and say, oh, don't look down. So he knows what's not below, but also at the same time then doesn't fall. And that's the ideal head state of an artist for making art in the moment for me, which, which I noticed only recently is basically a reformulation of Mims. It's kind of being both ironic and sincere at the same time. Bugs Bunny is both kind of knowing and not knowing at the same time. And that's the way to kind of navigate this this cartoon landscape. Um, it's an hour long, so it's quite hard to summarise, but I think that hopefully gives you a kind of taster of it. So I'll just I'll stop there, and if you want to ask anything, that's, that's, that's you know, that would be nice. Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, they were all in that other video, the, uh, the band. They're all in the Grubby Mitts. Oh, they were, until they all left recently en masse to be adults. Uh, I pushed them as far as it was possible to go. They, they have had babies and they got jobs in academia. Like, um, one's, uh, one's, yeah, one's working for the civil service, one teaches year one recorder, one uh, is a professor of film studies, and uh, Johnny, and the other, uh, Johnny is a musician um, and, does the str and does all my string arrangements. Um, so we will still, we'll still uh, um, but for a long time they all played in the Grubby Mitts, which was Grubby Mitts we always described as post-Mims. But this meant nothing to anyone because no one knew what Mims was. So we had uh, this, uh, um, but they've all, yeah, we've, they, they've, they've mostly uh, now retired completely from, my, from propping up my strange creative endeavours.
Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, I, I think there's one thing that runs through laws of motion, and it also runs through MIMS, is this kind of oscillation between certainty and doubt, and irony and sincerity, and knowing and not knowing. Um, and I think that that question is subjected to the same triangular fluctuation. You know, um, uh, you get moments of clarity. Um, the new show is really beautiful for me because it puts both me and my dad out there in this collaborative shape. But and ideologically, it's made for two audiences. You've got an audience who maybe have no interest in art, who've come in, who are in, because it's a show about nature and British social history and natural history, and then come out of it thinking about some kind of ethical questions around taking things and beauty and destruction and all these um, and people who come in who are interested in it because it's a new artwork by me and then come away thinking about how you know learning something about the natural world from my dad's point of view and that was a real moment of like okay there's another great reason for me to keep making things there's a moment of like this space of working between things you know moving things from one discipline to another or whatever um creates these moments of kind of productive yeah i don't know shared yeah where me when for me i suppose it's always been about art on its own terms is a purely autonomous thing i've always struggled with i've always like to just to be like as a I don't know, but it's also something I totally need. I'm completely, I don't know what else to do. I mean, I, like, I love being in the studio and just making things for the sake of it, but I often need to find a way to, I don't know, for, to justify it to myself. Maybe it's that simple, you know, constantly looking for a reason to why, to legitimize that selfishly so I can keep going, maybe, but also because if I, I don't know, if I, if I lose that sense of it, it having um, a potential affect, um, I... I don't know. I don't know how I would then justify it to myself. So yeah, it's been it's been a um, on the one hand it's been an absolutely blind and singular blinkered journey, and on the other hand it's but it's been one about all about paradoxically all about yeah questioning itself in its own crazy trajectory towards you know I mean it's not going anywhere it's not some straight line but it's always been about um, how can I find ways to keep on making sure that I can do this one thing that I feel when it works for me is the only thing that I want it want to do you know um but also i do need that from art now i find i find it very difficult to go in and make something not knowing what for now uh, at the moment particularly i think earlier on it was easier to justify some of that but now maybe conscious yeah uh the deep even more the deeper i get in the more and more i need to know why or at least to make a work that asks that question uh i think that's that's um Maybe that's what the work can do. It, it, it does provide a space to think through that, but also whilst, yeah, but not in a cynical way or not in a way like, I don't know why do, you know, but it tries to also answer it at the same time by saying, well, because of this or because I can, it can contribute this. Thank you.